Well, thank you, Anton and worship team, for that time of worship. It's great to be back with you here at Kesslinger. I want to begin with a question. <clears throat> Excuse me. How many of you now or have ever uh, worn a Timex watch on your wrist? Anybody, any Timex people? Well, that's probably because for the 20th century, uh, no company sold more watches in America than Timex. Uh, maybe largely because of their catchy slogan, takes a licking but keeps on ticking. Well, back in 1990, and you might remember this, they uh, came out with uh, what I thought was an awesome ad campaign uh, around this theme. They picked people who had had weird, um, challenging experiences, and they used them to sell their watches. They, they, were, they were print ads way back before the internet, full page print ads of portraits of people, and then their little story in a circle. I wanna share a couple of them with you today. In 1989, a guy named William Lamb was scuba diving when he was sucked into an offshore intake pipe for a nuclear power plant. He traveled 1,650 feet at seven feet per second before he was spat out into a canal at the power station. And it says his watch glows in the dark, it said. In 1982, a 20-year-old woman named Lisa Boyer went skydiving. Her parachute malfunctioned and she fell 12,500 feet in a free fall landed at 80 miles an hour in a four foot deep sludge pond at a sewage treatment plant. She hurt her back, but she survived and she's wearing a water resistant women's triathlon watch. But my favorite of all the ads, they had seven or eight of these people, was a guy named Edwin Robinson. In 1971, the 53 year old farmer from Maine became blind and deaf after a truck accident. Nine years later, when he was 62 years old, he was struck by lightning and shortly after his vision and hearing were restored. Now that's what it means to take a licking and keep on ticking. Now today we launch a brand new series of messages from the New Testament book called James, and the series is entitled Faith Works. Uh, one of the themes James deals with right in the first chapter we'll look at today and throughout his letter is the theme of how we as followers of Jesus can take a licking but keep on ticking. Talks about perseverance. But a little background as we start. Who was James? Uh, James was a very common name at the time, which you might know. It actually comes from the Hebrew name Jacob. Uh, and there's been debate throughout the centuries as to which James this is who writes this letter. Was it, for example, James, the disciple called the son of Alphaeus? Or was it the other disciple named James, who was the brother of the apostle John? But the traditional belief of the church right from the earliest decades is that this was James, the younger half-brother of Jesus himself. Now, Mark chapter six tells us that after Jesus' own miraculous birth, Mary and Joseph went on to have more children in the more conventional way. Mark six tells us that uh, how people were surprised when Jesus began his public ministry. He writes, they said, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? telling us that Jesus had four brothers and at least two sisters. And this is very interesting for a couple of reasons. First, because the Gospels tell us that Jesus' younger siblings did not believe in him or follow him during his earthly ministry. In fact, quite to the contrary, they seem to have been embarrassed by him. On at least one occasion, they tried to get him to stop making a fool of himself and come home. Mark tells us in chapter 3, when his family heard about this, that it's his beginning to teach and heal... They went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Now think about this for a minute. Can you imagine how difficult it would be to grow up in the same household with an older sibling who said things like this, John chapter eight. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Huh, what? John chapter 14, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 6, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. That'd be weird, wouldn't it? Maybe some of you have older siblings who think they're God. But <laughs> Secondly, James would have had a front row seat to the eventual arrest, suffering, and death of his brother as a blasphemer, one who claimed to be God. So it's understandable, I think, that James, for many years, was a skeptic when it came to Jesus. 
But in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus made a very specific and personal resurrection appearance to James, this James, his half-brother. And that encounter resulted in James being transformed from skeptic to believer, one of the more striking and miraculous conversions in all of history. And it reminds us that it's always an encounter with the risen and living Jesus that transforms and we know from history then that James went on to become the recognized and respected leader of the church in Jerusalem for some 30 years until he was martyred by being stoned to death by authorities in AD 62. So as we go through this letter, written about 25 years or so after Jesus' death and resurrection, we're gonna see some great similarities between how James teaches and how Jesus taught. James doesn't build theological arguments like the Apostle Paul does in his letters. James doesn't try to convince us. He just instructs with great authority the way Jesus taught. In fact, his style will remind us of the Sermon on the Mount. Examples. In Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. James says, as we'll read today, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. In Matthew 7, Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. James 1 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. By one count, James refers back to the Jesus Sermon on the Mount at least 20 times in his letter. So let's get started. I'm going to read um, 18 verses out of chapter 1 of James. A B- bit longer passage than we usually take on, so stick with me then we'll break it down after I read through it one time. James chapter one, verse one. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Pause there. Notice how James introduces himself. Servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's remarkable if you think about it. I think if I were James, I might start with something like this. James, half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, who knew him better than anyone, maybe you should listen to me what I have to say. But he doesn't say that. He calls himself a servant, a slave of the Lord Jesus. Now, why is he writing? To whom is he writing? It says, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Now, scholars believe this is sort of a general letter to be a circular letter passed around among the Jewish background followers of Jesus who had been scattered all throughout Asia Minor by rising persecution in the first century. Verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind, That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Now, we also know that one of the hardships these early Jewish background believers faced was economic because they were sort of ostracized from the business community. So James continues, verse 9. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom fails and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. And we're gonna take up that whole topic more next week. Verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And now he moves to a different kind of trial. Verse 13, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And now James concludes by instructing, um, his instruction about trials by pointing us to truth. He says, verse 16, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So James is encouraging these early readers to persevere, 
to persevere in trials, to persevere in temptation, and to persevere in truth. So first, faith that works is a faith that perseveres in trials. Some of you may know that way back in the early 1980s, I helped coach basketball at Taylor University as a way of working my way through grad school at that time. And every year as the players came back in the fall, um, the co head coach would immediately launch them into a month-long, four-week-long uh, conditioning program. No basketball, just sprints and long-distance running. And the players all dreaded it, but they knew it was, it was important to, to prepare for the long season. But one year, a new kid came out for the team. A big kid, six foot four, red hair, we called him Big Red. And he had played intramural basketball, but never had been on the varsity team, and he wanted, so he wanted to try out. And he had sort of bragged to his friends, we heard through the grapevine, that not only could he make the team, he'd probably be one of the best players on the team, but he'd never been through the conditioning program before. Uh, so uh, he, as we started the program, um, we noticed that Big Red did okay on, on the sprints. Uh, he tended to run harder when he knew the coaches were watching him, but he struggled on some of the longer runs because he was a big guy, and big guys usually struggled. Then came the last day, the last Friday after four weeks, the last day of the conditioning program was always something called the 12-minute run. Just line the guys up on the track, pull the whistle, they run as far and as fast as they can in 12 minutes. Sounds simple, sounds easy, it's, it's really not. It's designed as a test of endurance and courage. So, lined them all up, blew the whistle, they took off, Big Red right in front. After one lap, he was with the leaders. After two laps, he was behind most everybody. After three laps, he's 30, 40 yards behind, everyone really starting to struggle. At about five laps, at about the seven or eight minute mark, he was being lapped by the other guys and barely moving. At about the nine minute mark, so three minutes to go, nine minutes, he's on the far side of the track and he just stops. Turns around and starts walking back to where we were standing. Now you have to know the standing rule of the program was if you stop at any point during the conditioning program, you just cut yourself from the team. You have to finish. You can walk, you can crawl, you just can't stop. But he stopped. And so we knew what that meant, and we all wondered, we wondered, what's he gonna say? What's the young man gonna say when he gets back to us? He finally got all the way across, and he was still breathing hard, and he said, Coach, I've been praying about this a lot lately, and I don't have a lot of peace about playing ball this year, he said. Head coach looked right back at him and said, son, Middle of a 12 minute run is no place to be looking for peace, he said. Now what he meant was, you pray for peace before you come out, before you start the run. When you're in the middle of the run, you pray for courage and perseverance and endurance to finish the run. James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now this sounds wrong to us, it sounds backwards. What does he mean? Well, he says consider, and that word means to think carefully about, to think deeply about something. He says consider it pure joy. The literal wording is all joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, the word trials means what it sounds like it means, adversity, hardship, trouble, pain. Now, notice he doesn't say if you have trials. He says when you have trials. You know, there, there are some who teach that when you put your faith in Jesus, you are somehow going to be protected from or exempt from suffering and pain. That if you do experience those things, something must be wrong with your faith. You must not be doing it right. Well, that's not true. Jesus himself said in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 4, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. James points to trials of many kinds. And it seems to me there are at least three sort of broad categories of trials we can experience. The first category I would call predictable or even self-induced trials. Things we kind of bring on ourselves. Uh, my younger brother, Joe, who's a pastor in Ohio, um, has always had kind of a curious and fearless personality, which sometimes has been problematic. Um, and when he was about six years old, he had just learned to ride a two-wheeler, and he was uh, riding down a hill near our home, and he was coasting, and he likes to tell the story. He says he was looking down at the front wheel, just spinning like crazy, and he got mesmerized by it, and he just, the thought popped into his six-year-old mind, 
what would happen if I stuck my foot in the spokes? <laughs> yep. Well, he find out. He did it, and he flew over the handlebars, skidded to a stop on his face. I still remember he walked to the house just all scraped up. You know, that's the trial. It's not sinful. It's just kind of foolish and self-induced, but it is a trial. The same way, if you spend more than you earn, you'll experience a trial called debt. Self-induced, but still a trial. If you're a student and you go a whole semester without studying, you might experience the trial called flunking out. It's predictable, but yet a trial. But there's another type of, type of trial that I would call trials from persecution. These are trials we might experience solely because we're followers of Jesus. A little over a year ago, I was in Dubai for a conference of pastors and church leaders from all over Africa, uh, Asia, and the Middle East. There were about 250 people there for a couple of days, uh, and only about, most, uh, only about 30 of us were from North America. And at one point, one of the speakers asked a question and said, um, how many of you here have been arrested, beaten, and imprisoned for preaching the gospel? Hands went up all over the room. It was shocking. None of our hands went up, but the others did. Now, we live in a world where we don't face that kind of persecution, but many, many in our world today do. And James knows that these Jewish background believers are facing hardship, social and financial pressure, and would soon face political persecution. James himself, as I said, was stoned to death in 62 AD. Then thirdly, there are what I would call random trials. These are trials that are nobody's fault. They just seem to come out of nowhere, like the trials we experienced during COVID or the loss of a job or the diagnosis of a disease or sickness, maybe the death of a loved one. Hardly a week goes by here in our Chapel Street family that we as pastors aren't made aware of someone going through an unspeakable trial, a painful trial, a loss, heartbreaking stuff. I did two funerals last week. Now, James is not saying that these trials, these events are good in and of themselves. He's not. He's just saying that God is able to do something good through them. Verse two, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I want you to notice here the relationship between trials, perseverance, and maturity. It's what I like to call uh, the law of spiritual thermodynamics. James is saying that trials will happen, and when trials happen, they create pressure and heat and pain. But when we persevere, and the word he uses in Greek means to remain under pressure, to remain, when we persevere, God uses those trials to produce maturity and strength. And therefore, we can consider it pure joy. Now, this is hard for us because we live in a culture that doesn't encourage that kind of perseverance. In fact, we live in a culture that encourages and sells instant gratification. Way back in 1954, a man named Ray Kroc introduced a revolutionary kind of restaurant a fast food restaurant, eventually called McDonald's. And today we live in a McDonaldized culture. We not only have McFood, we have McFitness. You know, get six pack abs in four minutes a day. Or we have McLanguage learning, learn Swahili in three weeks. I don't, I don't think so. Or McWealth, play the lottery. But what about McFaith? What about McSpiritual growth? There are some things that cannot be produced instantly. And spiritual maturity is one of those things. So how do we move toward this kind of perseverance and maturity? Verse five, James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. And we saw back in our summer series from the book of Proverbs that wisdom is knowing how to live God's way in God's world. 
For James, that includes knowing how to live in accordance with God's will, how to think in accordance with God's will through all the circumstances, even the trials of our lives. It means that instead of asking, why is this happening to me? Get me out of this. Instead, we can say, what do you want to accomplish? What are you able to accomplish in me and through me in this situation? So what does James mean by doubt here? Well, he does not mean to have questions. He does not mean that doubting is just having questions. That's why we're doing the, the Doubter's Guide to Jesus seminars with John Dixon on Saturday nights. That's not what he means. What he means is a refusal to trust God. That is, to lack trust in God's goodness. To doubt means to have a half-hearted faith in God while also trusting the wisdom of this world. Sort of have a foot in both worlds. James means to doubt is to be a hypocrite in that way. Now, what does this kind of trust look like? In 2 Corinthians, the apostle Paul writes, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Faith that works perseveres in trials. Secondly, faith that works perseveres in temptation. In temptation. Uh, some years ago, I needed some cash, so I drove to the ATM machine, at the outdoor drive through ATM machine at my bank, and I just wanted to get $10. Now, you can't get $10 today, so you have to get at least 20, but back then, they signed a $10 button. So I put in my card, pressed the $10 button, money came out. Put it in my pocket without looking at it. Drove to the store where I was doing whatever I was doing. And when, when I went to pay for whatever I was buying, I no longer remember, I took the money out of my pocket and it was a $20 bill. I was confused. I put it back in my pocket. I paid with a credit card, I think. Drove back to the bank. I was almost positive I put in the $10 button. So I went back to that same machine, drove up to put my card in, pressed $10, a $20 bill came out. So just to be sure... I did it one more time, $10, $20 bill came out. Now I had a decision to make. Would I tell myself, God is so good to me. (laughs) Just pouring out his blessings. Or do I go inside and tell him their machine is being a little over generous? So that's eventually what I did. I won't tell you how long I sat there thinking about it. And they told me uh, that the machine was restocked. They must have put the money in the wrong, in the wrong uh, slot. And uh, it's been running for like two or three hours. You're the first one to come in and, and tell us. James 1.13 says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. A couple things to notice here. First, There's something we can't see in English translations here, and that's because James uses the same exact Greek word for both trial and temptation. The word is parasmos, which can mean either a test or a temptation. The context tells us which meaning is intended. So let me try to illustrate. Now, you may have been wondering what's on my little table up here. Well, here I have a plate of Fresh Brussels sprouts. Now, how many of you like a well-prepared Brussels sprout? Raise your hand. You know, you bacon wrap them or something. Not me. I can't eat Brussels sprouts. I have trouble being in the the vicinity of a Brussels sprout, which is why I'm holding it like this. (laughs) Uh, I have read, in fact, that there are studies who say some people have a genetic predisposition to finding a certain chemical in Brussels sprouts bitter and disgusting. I think I have that. I think I've always had it. Now, just in case, there's always someone when I talk about Brussels sprouts, just in case you're tempted to, oh, if, Pastor Brian, if you just had the way I make Brussels sprouts. You can wrap them in bacon. You can coat them in dark chocolate. Mm-mm. There's still Brussels sprouts inside. Not going to eat them. So for me, Brussels sprouts are a trial, 
right? They're a severe trial. I've never, ever been tempted by Brussels sprouts. But over here, can you see that? This is a chocolate frosted donuts from Graham's 318 in Geneva. These are awesome. I go there quite often to meet with people uh, for conversations, coffee, and these are always there, and I know they're there. And from the moment I get near the shop, I can hear them calling to me. I'm here. I know you want me. I can make you happy. I can give you fulfillment in your life. And that, that's a temptation. And now there's a similarity and a connection or a difference at a connection between trials and temptation. A trial is a test of faith and endurance by suffering or hardship. A temptation is an enticement to do something wrong for the promise of pleasure or gain. And the connection is a trial can, be a, can lead to a temptation, and a temptation is always a trial. But notice James says again, when tempted, not if tempted. He's saying, you're going to be tempted. I'm going to be tempted. Jesus himself was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. Being tempted is not a sin. Now, temptation um, is inevitable for two reasons. First, because our desires are easily corrupted, enticed by our fallen sinful nature. It's what the New Testament teaches. But second, because we have a spiritual enemy who desires our destruction. Earlier this year, we went through a series from Genesis, and you might remember the very first temptation in the Garden of Eden. What was that first temptation? Hint, it wasn't to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Listen to Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God has made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? That's it. Did God really say the first temptation is to question both the authority and the goodness of God. God's holding back in you. God's not giving you what you deserve because he's not really good. He doesn't really love you. So if God does not tempt, who does? Verse 14. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when full-grown, gives birth to death. So temptation is desire that is enticed or corrupted, and then it becomes a decision, which is when it's conceived, then moves toward temptation, and then becomes sin, and sin then leads to death. So where trial can lead to greater spiritual maturity, a temptation can lead to spiritual death. And then James goes on to point us toward the key to both trials and temptation, and that is that faith that works perseveres in truth. Verse 16, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might become, we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So how are we to respond to both trials and temptations? He says, don't be deceived. Now that assumes there's truth to be deceived from, and it assumes there is one doing the deceiving. He says, don't be deceived by trials, by pain and hardship. Trials do not mean that God is not good. Trials do not mean that God does not love you. Trials do not mean that something's wrong with your faith. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived by the lies of temptation. Don't be deceived by your desires. Not all of your desires are good. Not all of your desires should be followed. Don't be deceived by the winds and the waves of culture, by those who would tell you that, you know, you're, you gotta be kind of crazy to believe what you believe. You really believe in all that? In fact, people like you are the problem in the world today. Or the shifting waves of culture, of the internet, or of social media, or of the cultural narrative. Don't be deceived. Trust God's truth. Trust that he is good. Trust that he gives good and perfect gifts. Trust that he gives new birth through the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust that he promises to walk with us through our trials, that he knows what our pain is, that he promises to work through us and in us to produce good 
things, maturity. So, what trial might you be dealing with today in your own life? In a room this size, there are plenty of us facing something hard. It may be something smaller, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's something overwhelming and just crushing. Loss of a loved one, disease in a child. What are you facing today? Ask for wisdom, James says. Ask for wisdom. Hold on to the truth that God is good and can use even this to produce maturity in you. Hold on, keep running. If you have to walk, if you have to crawl, just don't quit. Persevere. And what if you're facing temptation? Maybe something no one else knows about except you and the Lord. What if you're facing temptation? You know it's a lie, but you're drawn to it anyway. You know it's destructive, but you're drawn to it anyway. Ask for wisdom. Same thing. Recognize the lie. Recognize that temptation is promising something it can never deliver. Recognize that the tempter desires your destruction and death. Trust the truth that God is good, that he gives good gifts, and that when you've stood the test, James says, you will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's our beginnings to James. We'll come back to many of those themes over the next couple of weeks. Bow with me now as we prepare our hearts for communion. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word today. Thank you for this letter written from one who did not believe, but came to faith through personal encounter with yourself. Thank you for understanding and meeting us where our trials and pains happen. Thank you for the truth that can protect us in times of temptation. And now, as we come once again to your table with bread and cup, thank you that even when our faith falters, even when we fall to temptation, your grace is great enough to forgive and restore. Meet us again by the power of your spirit through bread and cup. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You should have received one of our little communion cups when you walked in. Turn it over to the bottom side, the smaller side, and carefully peel off that label. There should be bread inside. Scripture tells us that on the same night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, gave it to the disciples, broke it and blessed it and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of him. Now turn the cup over, carefully open the side with the juice. After the bread, we're told that Jesus also poured a cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sin. The Apostle Paul reminds us that as followers of Jesus, each time we drink from this cup, we proclaim his death until he comes again. Do this in remembrance of him. Our benediction today comes from 1 Peter chapter 5. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered for a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Have a great day.